we got Blessings on blessings, blessings on blessings, you got Blessings on blessings, yeah, we got Blessings on blessings, yeah, yeah, yeah Yeah, blessings on blessings, yeah, yeah Blessings on blessings we discussed previously uh, the people gathering themselves to Aharon, um, identifying them as more than likely the elders of Yasharel. And we also talked about leadership responsibilities, looking at Aharon and the role he was assigned. Now, I want to look at what I believe may be an additional or additional circumstances that may have played a role in what took place with this event in Exodus 32. So let's begin by looking at four different circumstances. And number one, I want to go to Exodus 16, verses two and three, and it says, And the whole congregation of the children of Yasharel murmured against Moshe and Aharon in the wilderness. And the children of Yasharel said unto them, Would to Elohim we had died by the hand of Yahuwah in the land of Mitzrayim, when we sat by the flesh pots, and when we did eat bread to the full, for ye had brought us forth into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Now, I want to ask you guys a question, and if you could put the answer for me in the chat, that would be helpful, but what people or who was it that died in Mitzrayim by the hand of Yahuwah? What people was that? Hallelujah, Torah, Aki. That was the Egyptians. So Yasharel here is stating that they would have rather to have been reckoned amongst the Mitzri or the Egyptians. Let's look at example number two. And I want to go to Exodus 1, and we're going to do verses 8 through 11. It says, Now there arose up a new king over Mitzrayim, or Egypt, which knew not Yosef. And he said unto his people, Behold, the people of the children of Yasharel are more and mightier than we. Come on, let us deal wisely with them, lest they multiply. And it come to pass that, when there falleth out any war, they join also unto our enemies and fight against us. And so get them up out of the land. Therefore, they did set over them taskmasters to afflict them with the burdens or with their burdens. And they built for Pharaoh treasure cities, Python and Ramesses or Pi Ramesses. Now, here we can see that a new king arose. And he didn't know Yosef. And I will have you note that these taskmasters that he said over them, this is the first time you see that word um, in the text. Now, I broke this down what seems now to be a long time ago. But Egypt around this time is divided into two regions known as Upper and Lower Egypt. And when viewing these regions on the map, it is opposite of the way you would think. The southern portion is known as Upper Egypt, and the northern portion, which contained Goshen, is known as Lower Egypt. This is because the Nile River flows northward towards the Great Sea, or what we call the Mediterranean Sea. At certain times in Egyptian history, these regions remained separated and had separate kings and pharaohs. One such time was the period before and during Yosef's stay with Potiphar and his service under Pharaoh as Zaphonath Panea, which the Strong's Dictionary will tell you is of Egyptian origin. And then Merriam-Webster dictionaries and other dictionaries will tell you that its meaning is explainer of hidden things. Now, I agree with the definition, but not the origin. You see, the pay in panea in Shemitic languages, it means mouth, which makes sense because Pharaoh received revelation of his visions by the mouth of Yosef. The problem is, is in the Egyptian language, mouth 
is pi, from which you get python, or the mouth of thone, or pi Ramesses, or the mouth of Ramesses, or the one that you may remember, if you've been in my previous studies, when I showed the route out of Mitzrayim or Egypt, pi hi haroth, which means mouth of the gorge. By the way, Paneya is where the word Paneo comes from, the gland in your brain to which some people call the third eye. To make a long story short, during Yosef's time, Lower Egypt was ruled by Shemitic shepherd kings, commonly called Hyksos. After Yosef's death, Upper Egypt conquered Lower Egypt under the rule of a pharaoh named Akmosis. Now, some of you may have already known this, but for those of you who did not, Akmosis in Hebrew means brother of Moses. But don't run off too fast with, with that information because it does not imply what you think it does. You see, Moses in, is not a Hebrew name. It is of Egyptian in origin. In fact, Ramesses, Akmosis, Kabmosis, Tutmosis are all variations and derivatives of Moses. Moses in Hebrew means drawing out. It is derived from Masha, which means to draw or pull out. In Egyptian, Moses or Moshe means born of or to be born. So Tutmos means that Thoth is born. Kabmosis means Ka is born. Now, Ka is a very ancient Egyptian deity who ruled after the Scorpion King. Ramesses means born of Ra. And Ra in the Egyptian pantheon is a deity to what? Sun God. Toda, Aki. Toda. So technically, the implication is that Ra is born of the sun for Ramesses. Does anyone know what the moon deity is in the Egyptian pantheon? You don't have to answer that. The moon deity in Egyptian pantheon, it's spelled with an I, an A, and an H. And it is pronounced Ya or Ah. So Akmosis in Egyptian means born of Yah. Or again, born of the moon. The conquering of Lower Egypt by Akmosis is why in Exodus 1, you see there arose a new king over Egypt, which knew not Yosef. This king is not Akmosis himself, but someone from the line of the upper Egyptians. Let's look at circumstance number three. And I want to go to Exodus 5 through 19 through 21. It says, And the officers of the children of Yasharel did see that they were in evil case. After it was said, Ye shall not minish aught from your bricks of your daily tasks. And they met Moshe and Aharon, who stood in the way as they came forth from Pharaoh. And they said unto him, Yahuwah look upon you and judge because ye have made our savor to be abhorred in the eyes of Pharaoh and in the eyes of his servants to put a sword in their hand to slay us. So they're upset with uh, Aharon and with Moshe here. Continuing on in 22, it says, And Moshe returned unto Yahuwah and said, Master, wherefore hast thou so evil entreated this people? Why is it that thou hast sent me? For since I came to Pharaoh to speak in thy name, he hath done evil to this people. Neither has you or has thou delivered thy people at all. Now, in chapter 6, Yahuwah tells Moshe, Now you shall see what I will do to Pharaoh. 
And he goes on to say that he has remembered his covenant with Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, and that he is going to bring the children of Yasharel out with a mighty hand. Moshe again speaks to the children of Yasharel, and in verse 9, it says, And Moshe spake so unto the children of Yasharel, but they hearkened not unto Moshe for anguish of spirit and for cruel bondage. So what they're saying here is, we're not going to listen to you, and we're not going to talk to you anymore because of what you've done or what you've put us through. Now, circumstance number four, we don't really need to, to read a verse for it, but it is the it can be seen in what we read the last time we met with the actions of the elders in Aharon making the molten calf and them offering sacrifices unto it and eating and drinking and playing, so to speak. Now, what I have just laid out for you with these four examples are the four key components that characterize a person or people that are suffering from Stockholm Syndrome. Number one is those in bondage develop positive feelings towards their captor. This could be seen with Yashara saying they would have rather stayed and died in Egypt and been reckoned with the Egyptians. Number two is that there is no previous relationship between those placed in bondage and the captor. This is seen with Upper Egypt conquering Lower Egypt and placing the majority of its occupants, Yasharel, in bondage. Number three is the refusal by those in bondage to cooperate with authority. And this is seen with Yasharel's refusal to listen to and ultimately obey Yahuwah via Moshe. First, while still captive in Mitzrayim, and additionally with different occurrences, all the way up to Exodus 32, where we are now and beyond. And number four is that those in bondage begin to hold the same values as their captor. Seen with the creation of the molten calf and Yasharel attempting to honor their Elohim in the same way the Mitzri would do or the Egyptians would do. Eating, drinking, and playing, so to speak. What is interesting is if you study the timeline out, you will realize that Yasharel was not in bondage all that long, maybe somewhere around 80 to 100 years. They would have definitely been aware of and told of the exploits of Yosef and Yaakov and the tales of Yitzhak and Abraham, which tells me that it does not take long for a people or Stockholm Syndrome to take effect in that people as a whole. In fact, I'm pretty sure that each one of us on this call suffer from the same thing to some degree. If Yahuwah was to call for us to leave today, I'm sure that many of us do not have the endurance it would take to make it. We cannot endure the perceived hunger and thirst that would occur. Many of us would be clamoring to just return to a life where we could just open the fridge and grab something to eat or drink. And if that was not bad enough, many of us do not obey like we think we do. I cannot tell you how many people I've encountered that I've shown that to make it into the kingdom, you have to have the law and the testimony. This is what it requires. But even once they are shown the truth, they still go on and continue to live their lives, believing that they will be saved by grace through faith in its literal Christian religiosity sense, not Hebraically. That being said, the children from the lineage of the elders that we see in Exodus 32, those children would be you and I. Well, they have been in captivity in a nation not their own for far longer than 80 to 100 years. So how much more is Stockholm Syndrome set in and affecting you and I? Logic says that it has to, it's got to be much stronger than what we see here with the elders. 
The only solution is to die to self, let go and let Yahuwah. This means total commitment, every yod and every tall. Moshe understood this. This is why he is on the mount and they are not. Let us pick up with the reading of verses 7 through 10 in Exodus 32. It says, And Yahuwah said unto Moshe, Go, get thee down, for thy people, which thou broughtest out of the land of Mitzrayim, have corrupted themselves. They have turned aside quickly out of the way which I commanded them. They have made them a molten calf, and have worshipped it, and have sacrificed thereunto, and said, These be thy Elohim, O Yasharel, which have brought thee up out of the land of Mitzrayim, or Egypt. And Yahuwah said unto Moshe, I have seen this people, and behold, it is a stiff-necked people. Now therefore, let me alone, that, that my wrath may wax hot against them, and that I may consume them, and I will make of thee a great nation. nation. Hallelujah. I mentioned in a previous lesson that the action in verses 1 through 6, could possibly be taking place in parallel to Yahuwah reiterating the importance of the Sabbath in chapter 31. So here we are picking up the continuance of that conversation, and Yahuwah is instructing Moshe to get down because the people that he, Moshe, has brought out of Mitzrayim have corrupted themselves. This statement by Yahuwah about the people he brought out is a direct response to what the people state to Aharon in verse 1. As for this Moshe, the man that brought us up out of the land of Mitzrayim, we wot not what has become of him. Now we can know and understand that this is in response to that statement because in the following verse, verse 8, Yahuwah says, they have turned aside quickly out of the way which I commanded them. He goes on to cite their actions, the molten calf, and their words, these be thy Elohim, O Yasharel. This establishes that Yahuwah is the authority, and he has shown himself as much as such to all of them. Now, here's what I'm getting at. It's very easy to read this chapter and say Aharon told them to break off their earrings, and Aharon made the molten calf and built the altar before it. Aharon proclaimed a feast, and the people just did what they did because Aharon presented it to them. To me, that is a cop-out. Remember what I said about people saying that they are saved by grace through faith in its literal Christian religiosity sense. If you were to ask them why they think that, 99.9% .9 of them will say, well, that's what they taught us in church. And in that moment, they have proclaimed the church to be the authority and their reason for why they did not know or understand otherwise, as if they do not own a Bible and can see it for themselves. It's one thing to have the need for someone to guide you in your quest to understand and be obedient. Think Philip and the eunuch. In that type of situation, obedience and change typically occurs immediately. It is a completely different thing to know, or better yet, be shown the truth, and then continue to say, well, that's what they taught us in the church. Let's look at an Ak Netanel favorite. We're going to go to Luke 9, 62. And it says, And Yahushua said unto him, No man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom. Allow me to rephrase this for understanding purposes. No man having been shown the truth of Elohim and looking back to their own 
understanding and ways is fit for the kingdom of Elohim. The problem we and the elders we are reading about have is belief. When the elders stated we what not what has become of him, in essence, what they are saying is we do not believe. And the truth is belief requires proof slash truth. And Yahuwah already gave and showed them that proof well before this point. What we are dealing with now has nothing to do with belief. It is now action and reward or consequence. Obedience or disobedience. And this does not fall on Aharon alone. Aharon will indeed answer for his role. But Yahuwah does not say Aharon turned aside from what he commanded. He says, they, this includes Aharon. Verses 9 and 10, he says, this people is a stiff-necked people. Therefore, let me alone that my wrath may wax hot against them, and that I may consume them. It is an accountability issue. Sure, Aharon falls within Yahuwah's statement of they and them. However, by no means is Aharon's lack of aman, remember that from the Q&A? It means firm, faith, trust, belief. By no means is it an excuse for the people's transgression. We as a people, we do this a lot. We assign to someone or something the authority over our lives and then turn around and use that authority as an excuse for our lack of obedience or understanding. That's what the pastor at our church told us. Unfortunately, that is not an excuse. Now, I am attempting to show you this not because we need to identify who is accountable in this situation with the molten calf. I'm showing you this because in looking back at this example, we need to understand our own accountability just as much as we need to understand the missteps of Aharon and the elders. Now, the word stiff-necked, it means severe. But let's look at some of these descriptors in the definition. Cruel, grievous, hard-hearted, and these are akin to a wholehearted people, an opportunistic people. Churless, which means to be vulgar or have a bad disposition, difficult to work with. Does this sound like our people? Heavy, impudent, and impudent means to be bold, disrespectful, immodest, to behave with contempt or disregard for propriety and behavior towards other. Stubborn, in trouble, and of course, my favorite one, which describes what we are seeing here with the people, obstinate. Obstinate means to stubbornly adhere to an opinion, purpose, or course in spite of reason, argument, or persuasion. In other words, this means to give in to one's wants or desires despite instruction, commands, or truths. From this definition alone, we can know that this people would have killed Aharon if he did not give in to their request. Now, the AHLB, it gives us some understanding for this word, uh, kasha, all right? Kasha is spelled with the kuf and the nun. And Hebraically, it means bring together and press or bring together and destroy. 
Before we move on, let's look at that word, Amon. It is H539. Now, Amon, it means to build up or support, to foster as a parent or nurse, to render firm or be faithful or firm, to trust or believe, to be permanent or quiet, to be true or certain, or to go to the right hand. Now, go to the right hand is another way of saying to be upright, which is another, another Hebrew word, yashar, as in yasharel, the upright way of Elohim. Now, all of these attributes that we read about with Keshah is what Aharon did not exhibit when the elders approached him. His and their lack of being and standing firm, in essence, displayed a lack of trust, belief, and faith. Let us move on to verses 11 through 14 to see what Amon is supposed to look like. And Moshe besought Yahuwah his Elohim and said, Yahuwah, why doth thy wrath wax hot against thy people, which thou hast brought forth out of the land of Mitzrayim with great power and with a mighty hand? Wherefore should the Egyptians speak and say, for mischief did he bring them out to slay them in the mountains and consume them from the face of the earth? Turn from thy fierce wrath and repent of this evil against thy people. Remember Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yasharel, thy servants, to whom thou swearest by thy own self, and saidest unto them, I will multiply your seed as the stars of heaven. And all of this land that I have spoken of will I give unto your seed, and they shall inherit it forever. And Yahuwah repented of the evil which he thought to do unto his people. Have you ever been in a situation where you feel like someone is giving you information just to see how you react to it? This is what I feel like I'm seeing with this conversation between Yahuwah and Moshe. I feel like Yahuwah is sort of testing Moshe. Now, there is something that we need to remind ourselves of, and that is Moshe is serving as a mediator almost as a Messiah figure between Yasharel and or Yahuwah and Yasharel. Remember in Exodus 4, sixteen, it says, And he shall be thy spokesman unto the people, and he shall be, even he, shall be to thee instead of a mouth, and you shall be to him instead of Elohim. Now, this is important because when the people pressed Aharon, this exhibited lack of belief in him, Aharon, as an authority, which by default exhibited lack of belief in Moshe, who is serving as the visual image of Elohim. So again, by default of their actions, it exhibited a lack of belief in Elohim. In verses 7 through 10, Yahuwah informs Moshe of the transgressions and the intended consequences for those transgressions. And seemingly, without second thought, Moshe remains calm and firm in his belief and his understanding of what this is truly all about. Hashema Yahuwah, Yahuwah's name and his reputation. Moshe affirms to Yahuwah that he, Yahuwah, brought Yasharel out with a mighty hand, and he reminds him of the covenant promise that he swear by his name to Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov. In verse 12, Moshe suggests to Yahuwah that he turn from his fierce wrath and repent of the evil against his people. And we see in verse 14 that Yahuwah repented of this evil. Now, 
when I read this and looked at the word repent, I realized that it didn't it did not match up to what I was thinking or what I thought. I'd always heard and thought that to repent meant to turn back from or to have a change of mind or heart. But in all honesty, that is the Greek understanding of repentance. Plus, this statement, it would con contradict Yahuwah's statement in Numbers 23, 19, where he says, Elohim is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent. Hath he said, and shall he not do it? Or hath he spoken, and shall he not make it tobe or good? Repent is the Hebrew word naham. And it means to sigh or breathe strongly, to be sorry, to pity, console, to rule, to avenge. None of those definitions was really describing what I see is happening here with Yahuwah to me. That was until I looked at the Hebrew characters. Now, Naham is spelled with the Nun, the Het, and the Mem. Hebraically, the seed separated from the mighty. So what Yahuwah did was separate the seed, the people, from himself. This is key because it highlights a greater theme that runs throughout the Bible of selection and separation. We will also see Yahuwah say later on that he cannot go or be amongst the people lest he consume them along the way. This is because one, he is just, and two, his word does not come back void. And this is also key because the evil being spoken of in verses 12 and 14, that was and is going to happen to the people regardless. Why? Because Yahuwah has separated them from himself. Therefore, it was inevitable. Remember earlier on, I said that there is action and reward or consequence. Reward comes to those who are in and under the protection of the Almighty and are obedient. Yasharel has been has separated themselves from that protection, leaving only the consequences for their actions. Now, the way that Moshe responds to Yahuwah is something that we can learn a great deal from. Moshe at this point is a picture of true belief and walking in that truth. He has up to this point been obedient, has acted and done everything Yah has asked in a manner in which Yah would have him. He has been thus far righteous, allowing him to remain firm, stable, and clear of thought when Yahuwah informs him of Yahshua's transgressions. He and Yahuwah at this point are a hod which is why his suggestion to Yahuwah is the same advice that Yahuwah gives us. The same thing echoed by Yahuqanan, the immerser. Repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. Separate yourself from evil. Accept the reward, the consequences for your actions, and recommit yourself to Yahuwah. Let's pick up and read verses 15 through 19. It says, And Moshe turned and went down from the mount, and the two tables of testimony were in his hand. The tables were written on both their sides, on the one side and on the other were they written. And the tables were the work of Elohim, and the writing was the writing of Elohim, graven upon the tables. And when Yahushua heard the noise of the people as they shouted, he said unto Moshe, there is a noise of war in the camp. And he said, it is not the voice of them that shout for mastery, neither is it the voice of them that cry for being overcome, but the noise of them that sing 
do I hear? And it came to pass as soon as he came nigh into the camp that he saw the calf and the dancing and Moshe's anger waxed hot. And he cast the tables out of his hand and break them beneath the mount. The tables of testimony that Moshe is descending the mount with Verse 16 tells us that these tables were the work of Elohim, that they were written on and or engraved by Elohim on both their sides. The writing on both sides of the table is not exactly like you would think. What I mean is that you would not necessarily have to turn the tables over to read the other side like you would a page or a paper. They were translucent. In a previous lesson, I broke this down extensively. The tables mentioned here are made of the exact thing that the elders saw in Exodus 24, 10. And they saw the Elohim of Yasharel, and there was under his feet, as it were, a paved work of a sapphire stone. And as it were, the body of Shamayim in its clearness. This paved work of sapphire stone is literally the firmament. If you look at the, uh, the Jacinius Hebrew Chaldee lexicon for the Hebrew word for firmament, you will find that it's rakia. And the lexicon jump back over the lexicon describes rakia as being made of and like unto pellucid sapphire now pellucid just means translucent so the tables moshe is coming down the mount with were literally made from the firmament translucent and written on both sides by elohim Moshe breaks these tables by casting them out of his hand when he realizes what is taking place in the camp. Moshe's action of breaking the tables speaks to something larger at work here. And the thing is, is that the tables would not have been able to reside in the camp anyway. These tables were Kodesh they had been exposed to and written upon by the hand of Elohim. Something that is Kodesh, cleaned and or set apart by Elohim, cannot be in the presence of unrighteousness. Now, here's a concept that when I woke up, I learned um, very early on in my awakening, and this may help you to understand. And that concept is that Kodeshness and unrighteousness are both contagious. I will explain that deeper, um, those concepts deeper in future studies. Now here, Yahushua hears noise in the camp and he, he informs Moshe that it sounds like um, there is a war going on in the camp. Let me make sure I hop back up to it. There we go. And Moshe informs uh, Yahushua that is neither the sound of victory, that's what you have for mastery there, nor is, the, nor is it the utterance of those in defeat. But it is the sound of the noise of them having sex that I hear. That's literally what it says. The word for sing here is a na and it means to depress to humble to publicly humble another chastise to intimately humiliate a euphemism for forced sexual intercourse or rape now i do not think that rape is occurring here it could be, 
but I doubt it. If it were, you would see the word laka associated with it. And laka means to take. You see, this word laka, along with another Hebrew word, shakab, which means to lie down, and ana, you see those when you look at the situations with, uh, let's say, Lamech and his two wives, and also uh, Dinah and Shechem. You see all of those words present, indicating rape. Now, if you are familiar with the Moton Calf incident in Exodus 32, you will know that later on in this chapter, it will mention that upon Moshe's arrival to the camp, he indeed finds them naked. Now, I bring this up because there is a larger lesson to see here. All pagan cultures have days that they venerate within their culture. These days and their celebrations are almost always accompanied with some type of sexual ritual. You see this very prominently in Wicca, a sutra or Odin worship, witchcraft and their covens. Now, Yahuwah does not instruct us to honor him in this way. In fact, in the last Q&A, someone posed a question about the legality of having sex on the Shabbat. To which the answer to that is no, you cannot. And that can be found in Isaiah 58, 13. By extension, I would imagine that this also implies to feast days and other set apart times that Yahuwah has ordained as well. Now, the next time we meet, we will see and discuss uh, Yasharel's punishment. For now, know that they are guilty of idolatry, which is akin to fornication, and witchcraft in the form of their rebellion and their actions. Which makes the statement that Aharon proclaimed in verse 5, and when Aharon saw it, he built an altar before it, and Aharon made a proclamation and said, tomorrow is a feast to Yahuwah. It makes that proclamation even more suspect. We got blessings on blessings. Bless you. Bless you. You got blessings on blessings. Bless you. Yeah. Bless you. We got blessings on blessings. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Blessings on blessings. Bless yeah, yeah. Blessings on blessings. Bless yeah. Blessings on blessings. Yeah. Bless